Hi, everyone. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic.online, the humanities teaching website app. And I am back with Dr. Jonathan Cook as we do our second installment of Herman Melville's Battle Pieces and Aspects of the War. The way we have this program structured is that we trade off reading some of the poems and we do a little bit of analysis uh, with those recitations. So without further ado, I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Cook to read our first poem. Okay, so we're going to start out with The Housetop. It has a subtitle of A Night Piece and July 1863. Of course, it's uh, about the New York City draft riots um, that took place between July 13th and 16th. So here, here is The Housetop. No sleep. The sultriness pervades the air and binds the brain. A dense oppression, such as tawny tigers feel in matted shades, vexing their blood and making apt for ravage. Beneath the stars the roofy desert spreads vacant as Libya. All is hushed nearby, yet fitfully from far breaks a mixed surf of muffled sound, the atheist roar of riot. Yonder, where parching Sirius, set in drought, balefully glares red arson. There and there, the town is taken by its rats, ship rats, and rats of the wharves. All civil charms and priestly spells which late held hearts in awe, fear-bound, subjected to a better sway than sway of self, these like a dream dissolve, and man rebounds whole eons back in nature. Hail to the low, dull rumble, dull and dead, and ponderous drag that jars the wall. Wise Draco comes deep in the midnight roll of black artillery. He comes, though late, in code corroborating Calvin's creed and cynic tyrannies of honest kings. He comes, nor parleys, and the town, redeemed, gives thanks devout, nor, being thankful, heeds the grimy slur on the republic's faith implied, which holds that man is naturally good, and more is nature's Roman, never to be scourged. So that is a description of the draft riots. Uh, Melville was actually not in New York City at that time. He was living in Pittsfield, but he had uh, newspaper accounts that he read. He also had his, uh, his brother, Alan, was living in the city. So he had, you know, lots of information to uh, tell him about what happened during the riots. Um, just some basic facts. The, the riots lasted from July 13th to the 16th. Um, uh, it's been estimated that about 120 people were killed and 2,000 injured. Um, the reason for the riot, of course, was the the new conscription that was passed in the spring of 1863, so that uh, if you were if you could afford to pay $300, you could you could buy a substitute. Um, to fill your place. Um, and so that meant that the people who could not afford to hire a substitute felt that they were discriminated against. And there was resentment in New York City against fighting a war to free the slaves because, of course, you know, January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation had been... Um, set forth. So you had a lot of poor lower class New Yorkers who were very angry at being drafted to fight uh, a war that you know might they might not believe in lots of new immigrants from Ireland. Um, so that's why you had this explosion of rage and the target of the the main target of the um, riot, of course, or the targets, first of all, were the authorities who were doing the drafting, and then the city's black populations, because, you know, most of the people killed were black New Yorkers. Um, 
lots of innocent victims. I mean, all innocent victims. Um, there was a lot of rivalry between the black workers on the wharves, between uh, them and the a lot of immigrant labor, particularly Irish. A lot of discrimination against black workers in the city. Competition for, you know, low-skilled jobs was very high because that's what the poor blacks and and poor whites um, did for a living. You know, they they worked on the wharves, and and you know. Uh, transportation, things like that. So just to comment on the poem a little, um, the the form of the poem, of course, is in a Shakespearean blank verse, you know, iambic pentameter, um, ten beats per measure, and it creates a scene of, um, <clears throat> creates the, a sort of night scene looking out over the city and seeing the parts of lower Manhattan burning. A lot of the offices of authority or people in authority were houses being burned, the head of police, um, the mayor. Um, one of the terrible things that happened was there was a colored orphanage asylum that was burned to the ground at 43rd Street and 5th Avenue. Um, but there was lots of arson, lots of, um, you know, s s alarms in the night of bringing, trying to bring up fire equipment to put out these fires that were being started. Um, so that's why the the poem kind of emphasizes the nighttime setting um, and evokes the jungle. You know, he mentions the the sultriness pervades the air and binds the brain a dense oppression such as tawny tigers feel in matted shade so the idea is that kind of the law of the jungle is suddenly operative in new york city at at this time in in july 1863 um so some of the imagery is of of the jungle uh, there's a definite idea that the people who are riding are kind of regressing back in time. There's a, a, a phrase here, um, a man rebounds whole eons back in nature. It, it sort of reminds me of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you know, the, the sort of veneer of civilization, civilization is very thin, that certain things can happen historically and you know, the beast, the human beast can suddenly become apparent. And it's it's true of a situation like this because there was just unbelievable um, violence. This, is, this was the worst civil uprising in the history of the country apart from the Civil War. Um, four days of, of rioting and uh, arson and murder of innocent bystanders. Um, some of the other uh, imagery is um, the image of the troops coming to the town, what he calls the town, it's New York City, coming to subdue the rioters. You know, he says, why is Draco comes? Well, Draco, of course, is a famous, famously repressive classical um, magistrate. Um, uh, and... Uh, what actually happened was that, you know, after the first day of rioting, it really it took a whole day for any kind of militias to mobilize and to come to the city. So it was only after a full day of riots that you had some soldiers from um, Civil War units coming to the city to subdue the, to the riots. Ironically, some of them came from Gettysburg. Um, and they were, uh, you know, quickly brought back to the city to restore order, thousands of troops. So the poet here is saying, uh, you know, the, the wise Draco, he's bringing the artillery to subdue the town, and he comes late, in other words, it comes kind of into, into the middle of the riot, not near the beginning, and he says, it, he comes, though, late in code corroborating Calvin's creed. A very heavy alliteration there going on. So he's pretty much saying that 
having to subdue these rioting New Yorkers corroborates the idea of Calvin, you know, that all people are tainted by original sin, you know, this heavy idea that human nature is basically evil. Um, and the town is thankful, right? Everyone's grateful that the troops have come in to restore order, but they don't think about what the poet here says <clears throat> is the grimy slur on the republic's faith implied, which holds that man is naturally good and more is nature's Roman, never to be scourged. So the terrible idea suggested is that <clears throat> this explosion of violence <clears throat> is uh, it, it kind of undercuts the idea that human nature is is good. I mean, it's a Rousseauist idea that people are good and society is evil. Um, and this, it sort of upends the natural idea that America is a, you know, a country devoted to improve the human condition, you know, progressive ideas about, um, you know, uh, recognizing the good of human nature. Um, and finally, he alludes to this idea that that man is, uh, you know, naturally good, and more is nature's Roman never to be scourged. Well, of course, one of the laws of the Roman Empire, if you were a Roman citizen, you could not be scourged. But here, the the populace is being scourged by the military, right? So this draft riot seems to suddenly undercut um, or subvert all the sort of basic principles that the Union was fighting for, you know, to release the slave from uh, from um, his bondage and all that kind of thing. So, it's a real, um, <clears throat> it's as a poem, it sort of works against the positive depiction of the Union that you have in a lot of the poetry, the Union armies as the force of right and, and the Union as as the as the moral um, superior in this contest of the Civil War, it's it's sort of one of these um, sort of antithetical voices that's being heard that the uh, the effort to win the war was marred by you know terrible events like this that just sort of subverted the the whole purpose of what the Union was doing. So anyway, that's a that's a kind of a long explanation of some of the elements of that poem, which reminds you of, of Melville's preoccupation with the idea of evil and, uh, you know, how, uh, what its impact is on, on the world and where it comes from, if it's, you know, what part of human nature it arises in. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought that, I thought this was, a really interesting breakdown of this poem. The only two questions I had were that I'm noticing, as I noticed in the other poems that we've looked at so far, there's a reference to kind of astro theology there. We have Sirius, the dog star here. And I believe Draco also references a constellation. Does it not? And I wonder if that has any significance for, for Melville here. So that would be my first question. And my second question would be, were there any sort of corresponding events of unrest in the South, or was this just something something episodic that happened yeah, in the North? Yeah, well, nothing. Just to take the first question, the, there were riots in, in um, Richmond over bread, but nothing, nothing uh, even approaching the magnitude of this. Of course... You know, the South did not have any huge cities like New York. I mean, New York was, I think, probably uh, uh, over a million population at this point, um, much bigger than any cities in the South. So, um, yeah, so you had you had unrest in the South, but nothing, anything at the, of this magnitude. Um, you could see... If you could sow unrest, you could see how that would work as a strategic advantage on the battlefield, especially if they had to redirect troops and stuff like that, like from Gettysburg, like you said. It makes yeah. me wonder if this was ever considered to be 
uh, a way, a, a psychological operation that could be used as a strategic advantage in, in battle. But just kind of curious if there's a yeah more well, to the I mean, story. New York there. was New York was well known as a hotbed of copperheads, and there were mm. you know ar- there was arson attempted later on as well. So New York was very uh, a city that was on edge throughout the war because of the the presence of. Um, spies and agents and, yeah. and people. Like well, that. What's a copperhead again? Copperhead I, is, I haven't heard that. Term. Is a northern sympathizer with the South, right? Someone who's doesn't really believe in the, in the Union, uh, even though they live in the North. Were there were there Union sympathizers in the South, and did they have a name like that? Uh, no, I don't think they existed. <laughs> Huh. And well, Interesting. That's so fascinating. Well, I mean, you had parts of the South that were pro-Union, but they never got a name, and they were. It, it was you. Uh, you re- there was much more a sense of tribalism in the South, and and you know, um, getting rid of any kind of um, foreign elements. That's fascinating. That's interesting. So, what about these? Uh, what about my other question about the the reference to stars and constellations? Do, do you think there's any significance outside of the setting of night? Well, Sirius the Dog Star is um, uh, the time of, you know, it's always in the middle of the summer, the, sun, the, the time of, you know, heat and um, kind of craziness happening. Um, what, uh, I mean, M- Melville, you know, he knew the constellations well and he, he um, you know, he uses them in his, in his, prose and poetry um i just think he's creating a sort of visual of the city looking out over the roofs at night you know most of the buildings at this point were you know not much over five stories so most of the city you would just see it as all these rooftops of of five store um buildings you know manufacturing or residence or whatever um i think there's definitely kind of a shakespearean feel to this it it sort of makes me think of the Henry the Six plays, uh, which involved the character of Jack Cade, you know, the peasant um, uh, guy who rose up against, uh, you know, led the peasant riots in the in the fifteenth century in England. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the language uh, borrows from some of that Shakespearean um, trilogy. Uh, although I think it's one particular play that focuses on the figure of Jack Cade, you know, the famous peasant, leader of the peasant uprising. Um, so, well, I, yeah. I, I mean, we could talk, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic exposition. We probably should move on. Yeah, to let's move point. on. Yeah, to Lookout Mountain, the night fight. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'll be reading that. And I... My analysis won't be as thorough as Dr. Cook's, who's it's it's a hard standard to live up to, but I might have some interesting things yeah. to say. I definitely found some interesting things out about this this poem as I researched it. So here it goes. Uh, Lookout Mountain, the Night Fight, November 1863. Who inhabiteth the mountain that it shines in lurid light and is rolled about with thunders and terrors and a blight like calf the peak of Iblis? Calf the evil height? Who has gone up with a shouting and a trumpet in the night? There is battle in the mountain. Might assaulteth might. Tis the fastness of the anarch. Torrent torn an ancient height. The crags resound the clangor of the war of wrong and right. And the armies in the valley watch and pray for dawning light. Joy, joy, the day is breaking, and the cloud is rolled from sight. There is triumph in the morning, for the anarch's plunging flight. God has glorified the mountain, where a banner burneth bright, and the armies in the valley, they are fortified in right. So, I chose this poem because I I had the opportunity to visit Lookout Mountain uh, last year. And it was really wonderful. I took this train up backwards up the mountain. So I never knew that I'd be discussing a poem about it. 
apparently the battle has a uh, an alternative name too. I believe they so in some in some societies they call it the uh, the battle above the clouds, which I I thought is a really poetic way to name a battle. Um, but the just some historical background: the Battle of Lookout Mountain was fought on November twenty fourth, eighteen sixty three. And it was part of the Chattanooga campaign. And from what I understand, Union forces under Major General Joseph Hooker assaulted Lookout Mountain uh, in Chattanooga and defeated Confederate forces commanded by Major General Carter L. Stevenson. And Lookout Mountain was one engagement in the Chattanooga battles between Major General Ulysses S. Grant's military division of the Mississippi and the Confederate Army of Tennessee commanded by Gener uh, General Braxton Bragg. So... Some of the things that I thought were interesting about this, I had to do a lot of research just to, because I did, I, there, I encountered words here that I hadn't yeah. encountered before, such as Iblis and uh, calf. I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. Is it Iblis or Eblis? Eblis, I think. Yeah. Eblis. So uh, when I, when I, just my very little research into it, Eblis uh, is the Islamic equivalent of Satan. Uh, and Iblis was a, was cast out of heaven by God after he refused to prostrate himself before Adam. Now I'm sure it's much more complicated than that, but that's what I came up with. Uh, yeah. Uh, in my little research, is that is that yeah? Is, does that make sense to you? Is that does that resonate with you, Doctor? Yeah. Cook. Well, you could consider it, a, you know, as as a reference to hell and a peak of hell. Now, Melville almost certainly got this from a uh, a well known Gothic novel by uh, William Beckford. Uh, 1786, he wrote a book or published a book called Vathic, which is a very uh, exotic sort of oriental gothic about a the damnation of a um, of a young man um, and his uh, his you know inability to avoid damnation. So, I think Melville is re referring to the Islamic hell which is this sort of exotic um, realm of forbidding peaks and evil, right? So he, by referring to Eblis, it, it, it makes it sort of a little more exotic. Um, yeah, it does. As though this mountain is something out of a, some kind of fairy tale or like oriental fable or something like that. In fact... Yeah, from what I, underst you know, what I understand is that and I'm no expert on Islamic uh, history or theology, but from what I understand that they had a, a a sort of an enclosed flat earth cosmology and calf was one of these mountains holding up the sky. And so Eblis would be sort of at the top of this mountain of calf. And in a way, the, the, the storming of the mountain and throwing Satan off the top of this mountain is is part of the analogy that's going on here that these union forces are kind of this this force for good, this source for holiness that is going to take Satan off the top of this mountain peak. Yeah, is that does, yeah? I does think that sound about right. I think it's interesting because he also you could look at the reference to the mountain that shines in a lurid light. Well, the beginning when it's held by Confederates, it's associated with this exotic foreign religion of Islam, right? But at the end, when he refers to the, the, um, the mountaintop there, God has glorified the mountain where a banner burneth bright, and the armies in the valley are fortified and right. Well, the, he's glorified the mountain. It, it kind of makes you think of Sinai, right? Uh, yeah. You know, God's holy mountain, or uh, Zion, Sion, and Jerusalem. Um so the mountain, when it's taken by Union forces, goes from being evil to good because, you know, the real God has kind of won the battle here, um, and the the Confederates have been have been uh, you know removed from the mountain. Um, I mean, the well, the thing about this, when people write write when soldiers look back to this battle, they talked about the incredible energy that the Union soldiers had fighting uphill, up this mountain, right? It was some. It was almost miraculous that they were just filled with this sort of zest for conquest. And, um, um, 
And so, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I was reading a chapter last night in battles and leaders of the civil war, this, this audio book that I'm making for noetic. And apparently the troops just started charging up the hill without yeah, order. Without the oil, exactly. Uh, and, yeah. and, 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 uh, I think it was, I don't I'm trying to remember if it was Grant who went around to all the, the, the individuals that were under him and like, who gave the order for these men to go up the hill and all the, uh, lieutenants were like, they just did it on their own. We yeah. didn't even have to tell them to do it. They just wanted it and we couldn't stop them if we tried. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think Grant said something like, I'd never seen this before in battle. You know, it was like highly unusual. So the other thing about this poem is that it kind of is one of the poems that reminds you that Mel was firmly on the union side, right? He, you know, yeah. the might and right of the Civil War belonged to the Union, right? The, the the Union soldiers represent the good cause. And even though uh, other poems are less chauvinistic, you know, he's firmly in the camp that the Union is is um, on God's side, so to speak, which is where a lot of, um, you know, patriotic ideology comes from. You know, if you're fight whatever side you're fighting on, God is supposed to be on your side. In this case... There is some, you know, it's a plausible fact that it's a good thing the Union won <laughs> the war. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on right and wrong here, and um, to tie in with the religious imagery of the mountain going from the hands of the Confederates as a, a sort of fast uh, uh, stronghold of, of uh, you know, this exotic evil force and then being turned over to the godly Union troops. Yeah. Well, it was interesting is in my past, I've, you know, I've heard Lincoln mocked as a, an apish tyrant or something like that, but I hadn't, I hadn't heard Southerners referred to as anarchists before. And he uses the word anarchy Anarch, twice. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I thought that thought that was interesting. Do you, I do, think was that a sentiment widely shared in the North? Well, the the idea of an anarchist wasn't as someone who wants to totally destroy any authority in the state didn't really exist until after the Civil War. You know, we think of the 1870s and 80s as the age of the anarchist. I think anarch here is a coinage anarch meaning, you know, arc means first or the someone in charge of something so anarch means uh, against authority the word itself so I think the idea is that because the confederates are rebelling against just authority trying to leave the union then they are given this kind of um, coinage by Melville anarch which is just a, a person or a force that is refusing authority I think it ties in with the Miltonic um, strains of the battle pieces, right? You got a lot of references or implicit references to the war in heaven, you know, Milton's battle in Paradise Lost in, in Book Six uh, between Satan and the rebel angels and, and God and his angels of, of good. Um, so that's a recurrent theme throughout battle pieces is the association between the Confederates and, and the Satan's um, fallen angels. Well, I think we did a good job covering this one. Would you yeah, like to read the okay. next? Yeah, okay. So moving on to the Swamp Angel, which is about the um, a famous gun. It was called a Parrot Gun because the inventor was named Parrot. Um which was shot in July 1863 onto Charleston, South Carolina during the course of two evenings. Um, it, was, it was famous because it had a, um, a trajectory of about five miles. So you could have the gun you know, way out, away from the city, shelling it. Um, and um, the shells were actually... Uh, had phosphorus in them. It was called Greek fire. So they were exploding shells, almost like napalm. Uh, so it was a new innovation, the new, this new huge gun, and then the, these shells, which were incendiary de uh, devices. 
So anyway, here's the Swamp Angel. There is a coal black angel with a thick Afric lip, and he dwells like the hunted and harried in a swamp where the green frogs dip. But his face is against a city which is over a bay of the sea, and he breathes with a breath that is blasment and dooms by a far decree. By night there is fear in the city. Through the darkness a star soareth on. There is a scream that screams up to the zenith, then the poise of a meteor lone, lighting far the pale fright of the faces, and downward the coming is seen, then the rush and the burst and the havoc and wails and shrieks between. It comes like the thief in the gloaming. It comes and none may foretell the place of the coming, the glaring. They live in a sleepless spell that wizens and withers and whitens. It ages the young and the bloom of the maiden is ashes of roses. The swamp angel broods in his gloom. Swift is his messenger's going, but slowly he saps their halls, as if by delay deluding. They move from their crumbling walls farther and farther away, but the angel sends after and after, by night with the flame of his ray, by night with the voice of his screaming, sends after them stone by stone, and farther walls fall, farther portals and weeds follow weed through the town. Is this the proud city, the scorner, which never would yield the ground, which mocked at the coal-black angel, the cup of despair goes round. Vainly she calls upon Michael, the white man's seraph was he, for Michael has fled from his tower to the angel over the sea. Who weeps for this woeful city, let him weep for our guilty kind, who joys at her wild despairing, Christ the forgiver convert his mind. So there's a lot of historical reference in the poem that makes it much richer as a comment commentary on this event of the summer of 1863. Uh, this was all uh, the campaign to conquer Charleston, right? Because that was where the Civil War began, you know, the shelling of Fort Sumter in April 1861. So the idea of retaliation against Charleston was something that the Union really wanted to do. Um, it was also a strategic city to capture. Um, of course, just before the situation this, that this poem describes, you had the assault on Fort Wagner by black troops under... Um, Robert Gould uh, Shaw, who, um, uh, you know, led a very <clears throat> disastrous assault on this fort uh, with lots of his black troops, the 54th Massachusetts, being killed. Uh, and so that you could almost envisage this description of this black cannon shooting into Charleston as sort of further revenge against the South, against, you know, first of all, the defeat of these black troops at Fort Wagner, and then in revenge against the institution of slavery, which was, um, you know, very much supported by the people of Charleston. I mean, that was one of the intellectual centers of the, um, you know, the slave power, so to speak, Charleston and Richmond. So, what I like about the poem is the way it um, it never explicitly says that this swamp angel is a piece of artillery, but it it conveys the idea that this is an avenging angel, you know, shooting, sending these messages into Charleston. Of course, they it, it's damaging parts of the city. I mean, it didn't create a, it didn't destroy the city because. What happened was after, uh, I think, about 30 or so shots, the cannon exploded, the breach exploded, and it was in inoperable. So you had this huge hunk of metal there afterwards that, 
you know, couldn't do anything. Because they had mounted it in a very, um, a kind of muddy little island, and they built it up with sandbags, and uh, it was a very elaborate operation to get this gun positioned on this very low, swampy area. And uh, the soldiers who were working on this project dubbed it the Swamp Angel because it was going to preach to the um, to the Charleston people by sending these, you know, um, incendiary bombs onto the city. Another interesting allusion here is to when it talks about Michael. Uh, vainly, the, talking about the people in the city, vainly she calls about Michael, the white man's seraph was he, for Michael has fled from his tower to the angel over the sea. So Michael, St. Michael's was the old church in um, Charleston. It was the Episcopal church. It had a high steeple. It was a beautiful uh, 18th century church in the city the the gun did not destroy it but they used the steeple as a range finder uh, when they were shooting off these shells and they did it throughout the night they, they you know they did it about 20 minute intervals so um, from about one in the morning to about eight in the morning you had this constant explosions of these incendiary shells and uh, it created a kind of a shock in Charleston that the Union was able to do this it was kind of like, a, um, you know, when any new technology in war is suddenly is used and, and people are just appalled by, you know, the destructiveness can, of it. Can I ask a question about this? Um, were they firing on civilians? Well, they were mainly, no, they were mainly just trying to destroy as many buildings as they could. Because, you know, a lot, not that many people were killed during this but a lot of buildings were because they uh they uh you know they could just withdraw far away from where the last shell landed um but they were just trying to create a big uh black hole in the middle of Charleston you know with this gun to make a point to the to the people there and who knows what would have happened if the gun hadn't exploded but it was a it was a kind of a one shot deal they didn't replace it with another one these guns were unbelievably large, um, and uh, uh, what interests me too in the poem is is so, some of the religious Im imagery because it's it's almost like this angel, the swamp angel, is a is a figure of divine retribution, right? The South began the Civil War by firing on Fort Sumter, so here you have this huge gun, this black gun, uh, you know, with a thick Afric lip. Well, that's just describing the fact that it has a, you know, on a cannon, it's got a big rim around it. And um, it's it's sort of positing the idea that this is sort of a figure of retribution against the South. You know, this is a kind of a black figure who is... Um, uh, you know, forcing some kind of divine revenge against the city that began the Civil War. Um, so you have the reference to these shells landing in the city. You know, as I said, they began about one or two in the morning. Um, the poet says, it comes like a thief in the gloaming, you know, in the half light. Um, the reference there is, the, th the thief in the night is, is what um, you know, Christ was Christ's second coming was supposed to take place like a thief in the night. It's a phrase that you find in the New Testament used several times. So it's almost like this shell, this incendiary shell, is coming like the second coming out of nowhere. Um, and instead of being a vivifying, life-giving event like the second coming, this is a uh, something that destroys people. I mean, it's not killing a lot of people, but it's destroying their um, sense of security, right? Um, they live in a sleepless spell that wizens and withers and whitens. You know, all those W sounds, it kind of, you can see their faces sort of wrinkling up and getting pale and um, 
people are, you know, shocked by the destruction of this of this gun that's pretty much just burning up their city. Um, so it talks about how they have to move farther and farther away from the range of the gun and their property. You know, they have crumbling walls and um, buildings are burning. And then the last three stanzas, you have a kind of um, moving from description to um, these, these, you know, first of all, a query, you know, is this the proud city, the scorner, which never would yield the ground? You know, is this, uh, you know, Charleston was known for its fire eaters, the so-called um, you know, most zealous defenders of Southern secession, you know, were called the fire eaters. And one of their principal, um, <clears throat> you know, places where they could get it, always get a responsive audience was, was, was in Charleston. Um, so the poet is you know, showing really the despair of the city of Charleston as it faces this terrible um, artillery barrage. But at the end of the poem, the the uh, speaker is saying that we shouldn't really take any joy in this because it's a terrible thing. You know, even though the North is wants to inflict a lot of damage, they're not taking any great, you know, joy in this fact. It says, "Who weeps for the woeful city? Let him weep for our guilty kind." who joys at her wild despairing Christ the forgiver convert his mind so it's it's one of those instances where Melville becomes you know uh, compassionate towards the south and saying that we shouldn't take we shouldn't gloat about our victories here because we're all guilty war is a terrible thing uh, so he's stepping back from sort of the patriotism that you saw in the poem on uh, Lookout Mountain to to sort of lament the destructiveness of war, uh, but to so also show that this retribution was was earned by this you know chauvinistic city and its championship of slavery. So is there anything? Yeah. Is there anything that? Yeah. No. Yeah. The I mean the only thing that it prompts within me is 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 the thought that keeps occurring to me the deeper I study the Civil War, is is I really do struggle to understand how so much animus could be generated between the sides that Christian brothers could kill one another, like how how it got to this point. And I don't understand a lot of the preconditions of the Civil War. I mean we've talked about it some in Uncle Tom's Cabin and and uh, with John Brown, but. With such with such a religious populace, the the idea that yeah. they just didn't throw down their arms and try to reconcile sooner, or the fact that it had to come to this, it's just yeah, and that, well, that's a whole I, I other issue. Where really it's just helps, totally astounding. It, it helps you understand it because I mean it was uh, this whole idea of uh, the peculiar institution that was just such a uh, essential part of Southern society. I mean, it was a source of their wealth as a culture. It was a source of, of, of white solidarity. I mean, if you were the poorest white person in the South, you could take pride in the fact that at least you weren't a slave. So, you know, it was a whole different idea about how the world existed, even though, you know, you were, you, you were, had very similar ideas and uh, other, in other respects with people in the North, but the the whole um, fabric of slavery was a was a very intricate psychological uh, feature of the South. Not you know not just a physical feature, but it was in the mindset of all the South, and it uh, it, it 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 just took over. I mean you know the South. Not everyone wanted to secede in the South, but. Once they made right. the decision, they all were in it together, and you know you couldn't really say no. What, as a historian, what's your opinion? Do you think, do you think the the intellectual arguments against slavery would have, in time, taken hold, and the the institution would have been done done away with peaceably, 
Uh, and if so, how long do you think it would have taken? Well, if you just care to speculate. Uh, I, uh, it's really hard to say. Um, I mean, you know, England eliminated slavery peaceably in 1833, in Brazil later on. Um, but I think because slavery was such an essential economic feature of, of the country, you know, it was, cotton was the main export of the, of the U.S. by far, and, uh, um, so I, I just think it was just on a collision course, you know, starting from the 1830s, really. It, just, it was just a matter of time. You had Southerners who, who knew that eventually there was going to be a civil war, you know, uh, right from the 1830s. But really? it just got put, put off for, for a few decades. Yeah. yeah. I just try to get my mind around 700,000 casualties. I mean, I do believe, I do believe that that number trumps all other conflicts we've ever been involved in as a country yeah. together, doesn't it? Yeah, for for a country, yeah, for a country of about thirty million, um, that's you know seven million people dying in a war today, the equivalent you know of, as far as our population goes insanity all right so what is our next poem so the fall of richmond um, okay i gotta take a second to find it you, yeah. you want me to read this one yeah if, if you got it there uh, yes i have it now here goes the fall of richmond the tidings received in the northern metropolis april 1865 what mean these peals from every tower and crowds like seas that sway? The cannon reply, they speak the heart of the people impassioned and say, a city in flags for a city in flames. Richmond goes Babylon's way. Sing and pray. O oh, weary years and woeful wars and armies in the grave. But hearts unquelled at last, Dieter, the helm dilated Lucifer. Honor to grant the brave, whose three stars now like Orion's rise. When wreck is on the wave, bless his glaive. Well that the faith we firmly kept, and never our aim forsworn. For the terrors that trooped from each recess, when fainting we fought in the wilderness. And hell made loud hurrah, but God is in heaven and grant in the town and right through might is law. God's way adore. So what do you think of that poem? I have to read it a couple times. Um, <laughs> this is the first I, I've seen it since I read it the first time about a month ago. So, well, let's talk about it's, the history. It's, it's rich. Let's talk about it's the rich. history behind it. Um, so the date is April third, eighteen sixty-five, and that's when uh, you know the you had a breakthrough at Petersburg, right south of Richmond, and you know because the city had been under siege for months. Um, and you had the evacuation. Now, during the evacuation, the southerner, southern troops set fire to important strategic uh, areas like munitions dumps, and but the fire got out of control and started burning down lots of the city itself, and it burned a lot of the warehouses, you know, tobacco warehouses. That was a major crop, a major... Um, economic um, uh, aspect to the to Richmond um, and so that's why it talks about a city in flames in the in the poem and so uh, so of course the fall of Richmond was the first 
uh, sign that surrender was imminent, right? You know, because that was the f- the Confederate capital. Uh, Lincoln famously visited the city the next day and sat in right. Jefferson Davis's chair, you know, in his office. That's right. And um, so uh, it had a great symbolic importance. So in New York, uh, they're talking about... Um, uh, Melville is writing as uh, you know, having living in New York at this point. He moved to the city in the fall of 1863, so he witnessed this idea of the city and flags. Everyone had a flag out. Um, people were ecstatic. There was, you know, it was, it was almost like uh, um, the end of the war. You know, the feeling that people go out in the streets and start celebrating uh, VJ Day. You know, after World War II. Right. Um, so, um, some of the other interesting imagery, though, is, uh, Richmond goes Babylon's way. Well, of course, that's a reference to the fall of Babylon in the book of Revelation, you know, Babylon, the city of, um, you know, all evil and the whore of Babylon and whatever. So, it's a, um, it was a familiar refrain during the Civil War because, the war had such a, um, uh, it was given such a strong religious interpretation that, you know, people, generals and political leaders were given biblical names like, you know, the Moses or, or Gideon or, or, uh, um, who was who? Well, I, uh, for who instance, got, who got labeled what? <laughs> well, because of their deaths before the end of the, of the, uh, of the war, Stonewall Jackson was sometimes called, you know, the Southern uh, Moses because he died, you know, of that accidental wounding. And, of course, Lincoln, of course, was the other figure. But then again, Lincoln was the great Christ figure who was shot on Good Friday and and, and died, you know, a few hours later. Um, But, uh, you know, you had Moses, Joshua, Gideon, you know, some of the, Israelite generals were given, uh, their names were given, you know, none of them stuck. They were just sort of used at random once in a while. But uh, so the idea here is that the South is is the the land of, um, you know, uh, the Antichrist and Babylon is the fallen city. Um, And it's interesting because there's a famous song called Va- Babylon Has Fallen by Henry C. Work. He wrote um, songs for northern troops during the Civil War, and hit, one of his songs was called Babylon Has Fallen. Um, and the black, the freed blacks of Richmond were singing this as Lincoln um, uh, surveyed the city, you know, when he, when he, when he went up there to, to look at it. Um, so the references to Babylon are very uh, historically apt because many people thought of Richmond as sort of the southern Babylon as the capital. That's um, interesting what what you're saying about this uh the the application of religious language onto certain leaders and certain locations. Um I know there's a Hebrew there's a black Hebrew Israelites movement where um, there are certain individuals in the African American community that think of themselves as the true Jews and use yeah. verses from Deuteronomy to that seem to indicate that. Was there any idea here that um, that maybe the the black population was a lost tribe of Israel and the the Union was somehow liberating <laughs> them or, or any of that? Was that was that uh, idea no. in the air? No, not not at all. Um, but of course, you know, Southern blacks, all blacks, thought of themselves as oppressed Israelites who are in the position of needing a Moses to to lead them to freedom. Of course, you know, Lincoln had that role as a Southern Moses who freed them. Uh, I mean, uh, the Northern Moses, you know, who 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 led their their people to freedom. But um, so there was in, throughout the South. And Southern Christianity, there was an intense identification with Israelites as the oppressed people in in Egypt, who who 
you know, needed to find their Canaan somewhere. Um, you know, the, no, the lost tribes of Israel um, for 18, 19th century Americans were the American Indians. They were, they were ethnographically considered <laughs> by some various writers as as this lost tribe because they didn't know anything out, you know, about where they came from. So it was a kind of a crazy speculative idea. And of course, Joseph Smith, the Mormon leader, made much of that idea in in his writings. <clears throat> But just to get back to the fall of Richmond, um, so you have a, a sort of mini description of what it was like to, to witness the the fall uh, as a spectator um, of the event as Melville was as a civilian living in New York City at the time. And... Um, you have this r allusion to, you know, uh, the weary years and woeful wars and armies in the grave and hearts unquelled at last deter the helm dilated Lucifer. Of course, this is more about the South as um, equivalent to the rebel angels in Milton's Paradise Lost, you know, the dilated Lucifer. Um, that's an image from, from Milton directly. So the, here they're um, describing the fall of Richmond, like the f you know Lucifer's uh, rebel angels falling from heaven, and and then it says honor to Grant the brave, uh, you know General Grant, of course, who who had led the siege of Richmond, and um, you know so he's honored as the victor of this of this big uh, campaign. Which began really in uh, you know 1862 with uh, McClellan, you know, going down the Peninsula Campaign. Um, so there's also a reference to the you know the the terrors that have people have gone through in the past. You know, the terrible fear that the North might w lose the war. Uh, he refers to uh, when fainting we fought in the wilderness and hell made loud hurrah. You know, the wilderness campaign, of course, uh, in in the spring of 1864, uh, it was, was one of these terrible battles in the woods just uh, outside of Fredericksburg. Um, and uh, all that is past now. So in the end, you have God is in heaven and Grant in the town. Um, <clears throat> which is an interesting adaptation of a line from Robert Browning's poem Pippa Passes, 1842. You know, the, 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 the quote was, God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. Um, this is a poem from um, the 1840s that was fairly well known at this point of Robert Browning. So Melville was adapting this little cute phrase from Browning's poem to uh, to convey the idea that with Grant in control everything is is good, you know, and uh, of course each refrain at the end of each stanza is just a short statement that we should be um, grateful to God that this has happened. You know, the last line of the poem is "God's way adore." Uh, so it's kind of a it's sort of so it had, the poem has a sort of a liturgical quality because you've got the stanza and then you've got this short italicized liturgical response. Um, so it's almost it's almost like a religious um, uh, you know inf inflected um, poem that you know honors Grant but also gives gratitude to to the creator for this for this victory so um uh, the only thing i would interject here is like, again we have the stars we've got yeah we've got three a stars Ryan's now like Ryan's here in the second. well three stars that yeah. that's uh you know that's his um his rank right he's he was uh the only uh, you know major general uh, of the of the of the military <clears throat> so it's 
sort of seeing the little stars on his collar as um, um, gleaming, you know. Uh, they, the stars now like Orion's rise, right? So the Orion, the constellation, is like these this rising of Grant as the great hero of the war, the one who's brought the war to a conclusion, right, with his superior generalship. Yeah. Could, and I, I, I do believe, you know, there's a, an occultic significance of those stars because there's an alignment with the, the pyramids, right? Do I have that right? But there's also, isn't Orion, is it, is it mentioned in the Bible? Um... I can't remember. I don't know. I'll have to look at that. I don't think so. I mean, constellations are, are you know, mainly Greek. They're not Hebrew. Yeah, but, you know, they're in there. They're in there. It's Amos 5.8. He who oh, made really? the Pleiades and Orion and oh, turns yeah? deep yeah, in, into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. also Job thirty eight thirty one. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? There's a oh. couple other places, but Orion's okay. got it shows up in yeah. the Bible a number of times actually. Okay, well that's I'm glad you pointed that out because I I haven't checked that out and it there's probably uh, some history behind that illusion there um, um, that you know is something that I haven't explored in this poem. Well, uh, but a rise and rising. I don't know when. When does that happen during the year? Because he's talking about when wreck is on the wave. It's like Orion rises maybe during a storm season, when when ships are wrecked. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to look into it. I don't. I I could look it up right now, but it would. Yeah, I think a lot. You you you'd hear me typing on my keyboard a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It's good to know, though, that it is it is actually a biblical um, illusion, possibly there. Yeah, it's the only reason it stuck out because I I think only only a couple uh, constellations are within yeah. the Bible, and that and that's why I remembered it. Well, we've been going for about an hour. Do you want to? You want to just do one finish more? off with the martyr? Or, are you? Has it been yeah. an hour? I think it's been about an hour. Yeah, we could we could finish off with the martyr. Okay, well, well let's, do, let's do that then. Okay, so this is um, the martyr, of course, is Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it's it's the only poem about the assassination of Lincoln. Um, and reflects the, the mood at the time, which was in some ways not exactly the way we look at the death of Lincoln today, but represents the feeling of anger and rage that the assassination, you know, occurred um, just, what, six days after uh, uh, the surrender of um, Lee um, on Palm Sunday. And, you know, just when everyone was ecstatic about the war ending, you had Lincoln shot, and then you suddenly thought, maybe the South is, is rising again. They've got you know, this is just the beginning of some new guerrilla campaign. Um, so we forget that there was the fear that the war was going to be prolonged because somehow um, the assassination was a plot designed to, um, uh, you know, planned and executed out of Richmond, you know, out of the top... Confederate command, where we know today, of course, that that's not true. Anyway, I'll read the poem, The Martyr, indicative of the passion of the people on the 15th day of April, 1865. Good Friday was, that, was the day of the prodigy and crime when they killed him in his pity and they killed him in his prime of clemency and calm when with yearning he was filled to redeem the evil willed and though conqueror be kind. But they killed him in his kindness, in their madness and their blindness, and they killed him from behind. There is sobbing of the strong and a pall upon the land, but the people in their weeping bear the iron hands. Beware the people weeping when they bear the iron hand. He lieth in his blood, 
the Father in his face. They have killed him, the forgiver. The avenger takes his place. The avenger sternly, I'm sorry, wisely stern, who in righteousness shall do what the heavens call him to, and the parasites remand, for they killed him in his kindness, in their madness and their blindness, and his blood is on their hand. There is sobbing of the strong, and a pall upon the land, but the people in their weeping bear the iron hands. Beware the people weeping when they bear the iron hand. So, the poem describes the assassination actually took place on April 14th, Good Friday. He died a few hours later, you know, on Saturday the 15th. Um, so the idea, the, the poem sort of captures the rage of the North at the killing of their great leader. And when it talks about they killed him in his prime, you know, the idea is that there was some kind of conspiracy. It wasn't just John Wilkes Booth. They they knew it was Booth pretty quickly. I think that the same, you know, on Saturday, they knew it was Booth because everyone saw him in the theater. They knew who he was. But they thought that <clears throat> there were other people behind this act. So they were, were kind of blaming the whole South. What? Were there, were there other incidents? Uh, was there an attack on... S Seward at yeah this Seward time too? Seward yeah yeah there was uh the 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 um the guy who attacked Seward you know slashed him up and he was in a sick bed right so he he, he right. got his way in the house cuz he claimed he was delivering some medicine he got past the guards and um he he almost killed him um uh, cutting him up but he was he was apprehended and and, and, and they hung. Did, and from what I and from my understanding they, didn't they hang a bunch of conspirators yeah yeah i mean what it was five or six were hung uh, including mary surratt who was you know the woman who kept um who had a house where this some of these conspirators supposedly met in maryland but the poem really reflects the the idea that you know this was the south's uh, plotting of uh retaliation the, you know, the final vicious act of killing Lincoln that um, is is so upsetting after everyone had thought the war was over with with uh, the surrender of Lee, and it you know presents Lincoln as the martyr, right? He's the Christ figure. He's he's killed. He's an innocent who's who's killed for our sins, which is a common. Um, allusion to uh to you know Lincoln's sort of symbolic identity and um so you know it's a kind of a warning poem you know beware the people weeping when they bear the iron hand so the idea is that you know there's going to be retaliation on the south somehow which <clears throat> there was a lot of talk about this there was uh, uh you know people were arrested and tried um, but they, uh, ultimately the trial, you know, weeded out the people that they thought might be conspirators and found, you know, some of the likely people and they were tried. Some of them, some, uh, a bunch of people were, <clears throat> were let off, but, you know, there was a more concise attempt to, to find the actual assassins. Of course, Booth was killed in a barn in, in, in Virginia, um, so the idea is the Avenger takes his place. Well, that's the idea that that President Johnson, you know, who's going to be president now, is going to avenge the crime of the assassination. Uh, of course, that turned out to be uh, a big disappointment because Johnson fairly quickly um, became a kind of ally to, you know, the Southern integration back into the Union without any real... Um, sacrifice. You know, some of the same political leaders were were allowed back in Congress after leading secession. You know, so there's a big, huge disappointment with Johnson, of course, that led him to the brink of impeachment. <clears throat> and uh, 
So it reflects the confidence that, that Jonathan was going to go after the assassins here, which is what people were feeling. Yeah, you know, he, he had a reputation of hating the slave owners, um, which, which he did. He hated the wealthy slave owners, but he himself was, you know, from Tennessee, so he, he sympathized with, you know, other people in the South and their predicament much more than the, than the Republicans wanted him to. Um, so, pretty much this, the poem just is a very good representation of the immediate mood of the country at, at about the time of the assassination and, and for a few weeks thereafter until the situation clarified <clears throat> itself. You know, the trials took place a couple of months later, but there was an interim period of bewilderment and concern that they didn't know who was behind the assassination. And, um, you know, a lot of people were kind of freaking out because of that. So, do you have any... Well, I, I... Comments on you know, I didn't, any of this? I, when I... I, I'm just kind of curious to historical context a little bit more. Um, you know, growing up, I only heard about John Wilkes Booth, and I've become privy to some more of these details about a larger group, a larger assassination plot. Who, in the public's mind, where did what did they ultimately? If it didn't come from the South, if it wasn't a Confederate plot, where did the investigations and the public sentiment lead as to who orchestrated this? Um, well, there were thoughts that, um, you know, there was, there was supposedly people up in Canada, Southern agents in Canada who, who were supposedly, who were brought in and interviewed and they were, uh, I forget their names. They were, they were Southern agents who were dealing with Canadian affairs during the war. They were at first accused and Davis was, accused, um, and um, it just took a while for um, the the facts to emerge, because of course Booth was killed, you know, when he was trying to escape um, a few days later, um, and but of course they had um, the guy who tried to kill Seward, and they had... Uh, you know, a lot of people who saw little things here and there, and and you know, Dr. John uh, Mud, Dr. Samuel Mud was in, was implicated, but he was not tried. Um, so you had lots of witnesses to sort of bits and pieces of conversation, so that it just took a lot of time to narrow down exactly what the story was, and and this took place, you know, in the courtroom. Um, uh, over the next few weeks, uh, but no one really knew this at the time. They just knew the fact of Lincoln being killed right after the surrender, so they thought it was some kind of like stab in the back, you know, some beginning of a whole new guerrilla warfare phase of this of the war. Yeah, mysterious. Um, hey, something else I was kind of interested in is that I didn't. I, I didn't realize that, uh, I mean, I guess I realized, but I was reminded that Johnson was the first, first president to be impeached, wasn't he? Yeah, well, he was impeached, but he wasn't, he wasn't actually convicted. You know, he, he got off right. on like a single vote or something, right? So, so yes, how did, he, how did, he, they how, actually went to how, trial. And uh, So w what caused the shift in the opinion of him if he was this kind of iron-fisted ruler to being in to having the public turn against him. Well, it was mainly the fact that he they thought, you know, the Republicans thought that he was he was being too easy on the south, you know, all the sacrifice that the north had had uh performed was being wasted with this guy who was readmitting or taking their oath of loyalty without really requiring them to uh give up anything. And, uh, of course, you know, it takes a two-thirds vote in the Senate to impeach, so that's a pretty high threshold, and they didn't quite reach it, even though, you know, there were a lot of very angry uh, Republicans who, who just hated him.
and he you know he didn't have a good reputation as well because he you know he he was a drinker and he was uh he made some he did some crazy things in his you know he he really was kind of a flaky guy as a character and uh some of his speeches were were pretty you know stupid and incoherent so he's he's not really one of our very good presidents um and uh but it, uh, what i what i find interesting about the poem is that it, it kind of implicitly alludes to lincoln's second inaugural address you know with with uh malice towards none right uh and forgiveness for for all uh and um the poem is saying you know that's what lincoln wanted but now we're going to turn to the avenger you know Lincoln was good, if but he now you killed him. So now you had your chance. Uh, we're gonna come and get you, you know, with this guy Johnson, um, which of course didn't happen. Um, but it it just it it reflects the historical moment of of the North at that time. That you know they loved Lincoln. They loved uh, they 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 appreciated the fact that he was ready to forgive the South in a lot of ways. But then. Um, uh, he wouldn't have been as generous to the South in terms of readmitting uh, some of the leaders of the Confederacy back into Congress. Well, okay. I, well, are we, get, do you think we covered this ground well? I enough? think I think we did, and I I, I have to say, I, I I've really enjoyed this second installment. I. The deeper we get into this material, the more I enjoy it. And I want to thank you for your very clear expositions of the historical context and the poems today, Dr. Cook. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, uh, it's it's really incredible. Isn't there so much material here in the in these stanzas? Yeah, well, you know, you got a lot of a lot of other poems to talk about. <laughs> these are just some of, the, some of the the highlights, and uh, so yeah, well. <clears throat> Maybe I we'll really consider, enjoy it. Thank. You. We'll consider another conversation, maybe on some more poems. I would love that. I would love that very much. All right, thank you, Doctor Cook. I will have this audio up and edited later this evening or tomorrow morning, and you can find it, find it at Noetic Online or SoundCloud or YouTube or your podcasting app. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.